Right, hey everybody, so welcome back. I hope you enjoyed last week's video where we talked about the effects uh, in the Jeep sequence. So I hope you picked up some interesting tips and tricks, I guess, uh, on how to do some effects in your own sequences. So with that out of the way, we can get into the uh, scene assembly, lighting, shading, all that good stuff. This is probably where my workflow has changed the most during the past uh, couple of years. This was when I was still sort of figuring out my sort of like the, the folder structure thing that I that I have a video about. Like if you haven't seen that, you can check that out with the link in the description. But uh, these days I have sort of a preset folder structure with some, uh, just with some pipeline-ish tools, I guess. Some, just some ACAs that I use to organize all my projects. So that's when I was still figuring that out, when I didn't have that sort of wrapped up. So uh, organization in this project is... Uh, little like different from how i do it nowadays so if you're wondering why that's why um like if you're setting up your own project i probably recommend doing it more that way i'm doing it now or or if you have your own way that's also fine but like probably don't do the organization how i did it in this cheap sequence i just want to point that out um and there are some other things that i kind of want to go into before we get into the actual video so uh i'm using a lot of mega scans assets in it some things have quite significantly changed that. So when I did this Jeep thing, that was before there was any of the Megascans bridge to Houdini. Uh, so there wasn't any easy way to sort of hook up everything. So what I did when I made my Jeep sequence, I made my own uh, sort of asset browser thing to easily navigate all of the all of the assets, go through uh, LODs to link up everything inside of shaders, etc., etc. All of that has obviously become obsolete. Uh, because now you have the Megascans bridge. So if I go to... Whoop, like you have these this Megascans bridge thing now. So let me just remove this. I'm going to demo something in Houdini real quick. Uh, so like these days you have the bridge thing which you can keep open. You can click export. And then Houdini is going to think. And then boom, you have it in there. So that wasn't available when I uh, made my Jeep scene. So it was a lot more cumbersome to deal with uh, Megascans assets. So that's why I'm doing a lot of the things that you see in the video when dealing with the Megascans assets. So that that changed like quite significantly. Um, so another thing that I kind of want to point out, which is going to be useful. In the Jeep sequence, what I had uh, done is I had sort of, a, I made a glow an, like an HDA with a, with a global variable or just a null, I guess, with a global variable on it that, that said dollar megascans. And then dollar megascans will change the location of your megascans folder. So then you can easily localize your project. It's actually another way to also easily lo uh, localize. Oh, let me just do the, do the thing, right? So there's also another way to uh, to easily localize your, your project uh, if you're, if you're uh, working in Houdini. So I want to demo that also in this same Houdini sequence real quick. So let me just uh, close my full screen thing again all right there we go so another way to uh localize your stuff i uh, thought it would be cool to throw this in here so uh you can see this is pointing here to my to my um to this directory so that's uh let me just copy that path oh no i don't want to do that yep and Right, so it's going to this directory, but let's say I wanted to go to another directory. So I also have my, um, I also have one over here. This is my network drive and I'm, uh, so it's, it's kind of the same thing. So let's say I want to change this path to uh, to the new directory. So this is my network drive. So this is my local NVMe and I want to change it. So another way I could do this, uh, like on a, in your entire project, is let's say I want to change the entire folder here. So let's copy the uh, the downloaded folder here. But you can go you can go to window, text port, so HCube text port. And there's a command here called op change. And if you do it in the text port here, it will do it. There's also extra commands you can add, by the way, uh, but I'll leave that up to you to find it out. You can also do it in specific context, but if you just type op change, uh, so operator change. So it will, if you do it, do it like this, it will replace a string in your entire document. So I could do, so I could uh, paste here this path. So to the download folder on my NVMe. And then when I change it to here, the download folder on my uh, network drive. So, right. So OP change and then the path space and another path. So if I press enter and 
Uh, oh, wait, sorry. I need to... Yeah, it's because I have the... That's also, that's a thing with Houdini. Uh, like, it needs to... Like, Windows has the... Has the backslashes instead of the forward slashes. Which doesn't... Is not... Doesn't make sense, but yeah, that's how Windows does it. So, all right, I need to paste and I need to change these backward slashes to forward slashes. All right, so if I'm going to press enter now, boop, yours, you can see, uh, oh, changing. So it's going to look around the entire uh, Houdini file and it's going to change all the parameters. And you can see it changed the, uh, the thing to my network drive. So that's probably, an, like if you didn't know that, that's an easy way to sort of replace anything in your uh, in your, in your your file. You could also use that for other stuff. Like if you uh, if you happen to use dollar $hip somewhere and you want to change it to make sure that it's a dollar job, you could also do that. You could say, uh, uh, where is the, I could say, if you change uh, dollar $hip to dollar job. I, I'm not using that anywhere here, so it's not, it's not referencing anything now, but... Um, so that's a, this is an easy tip, easy tip, tip that I wanted to throw in there, which, which I'm not using in the main video, but like, that's an easy way to, to change your path of your, of your mega scans. So that's probably what I would do now. So I wanted to throw that in there. Um, all right, let me do the, do the full screen thing again. All right. So another thing that I also want to discuss is in this video, in the shading video, I'm mentioning one part where we're talking about a uh, water shading. Is that there was a an issue with sort of flickering in the refraction of the uh, of the water, uh, which I wasn't able to figure out when I did the actual project, and actually ran into that same issue a while back when I did a uh, uh, client project, and I finally found out what the what the issue was. So in the Jeep sequence, I I fixed it another way by messing with the re with the index of refraction. So uh, what actually? So there was a flicker in the refraction, and I couldn't figure it out. Like I, I did like dozens of renders in order to to figure that out. What actually caused it is that I had compressed fluid surface, I think. And it, the problem is if you un if you unpack a compressed fluid surface. So if you make, let me just make a, let me make a just a shelf tool thing. We just uh, oh wait, let me. You're right. There we go. So if you make just a, let's do a shelf to fluid sim, particle fluids, and just do emit fluids like that. And it's just, uh, let's just emit some fluid. Uh, all right. So, and this will probably like in this case, not like, so what it does here, it's, it's, it's compressing, it's compressing it. Oh, I, and my face is a little bit in the way, but uh, let me just do it like this. Rip. All right, so it's compressing it here, so making it a lot smaller. It exceeds nine megabytes here and then three here, which is great. But uh, what I sometimes do is like, sometimes you need to do some sub-level manipulations on your point. So then you would like unpack a uh, point. All right, then you have your points back. But uh, so this is where the, uh, where the issue comes from. So this does some uh, stuff with uh, curling the bandwidth and et cetera, et cetera. If you plug this directly in your particle fluid surface, you get a very nice mesh and it, it's a solid mesh and works well. If you unpack it, uh, you do some like, let's say I want to, I, wanna, I don't want to like cut some points or I want to say like, all right, if uh, P.Y is above uh, one, remove point. Uh, like I want to do some point level stuff like this, for example. And I were to were to match this, um, then oh, you can actually see it here. Let's see if it's also still the case if I don't do that. Yeah, so you can kind of see it here. So it's it's uh, it gets like this sort of air pocket uh, in between here. Uh, yeah, which. So of course, if and it's it's gonna do that selectively. Like it's sometimes gonna like be in the curling bandwidth, sometimes gonna be outside of the curling bandwidth, and then so it's gonna get like it's gonna get air pockets that are gonna be there and not be there, be there, not be there, be there, not be there, etc., etc., etc. Well, the problem there is that like I'm not sure if it's if this is a good example, but uh, the yeah the problem there 
is that if you get that, you're going to get these flickering uh, stuff. So if you ever run into that issue, uh, well, that's what it is. It's probably cache without fluid compress or cache, cache both with fluid compress and without fluid compress and uh, do it like that. Uh, so I want th those are two things that I kind of wanted to throw in there before we get into the actual video. Right, so that's about everything that I kind of wanted to discuss before we get into the actual uh, video. There's some other things, of course, that I would do differently now, but like, I mean, workflows always change, and that's always what you're going to get. Uh, like, it was a, always if you look back on your old stuff, you're like, ah, oh, why did I do this? Why did I do that? Anyway, those were some major things that I wanted to discuss. Um, anyway, without further ado, let's get into the lighting shading. Uh, part of this, uh, I think, it should uh, still be pretty make for a pretty interesting video. So this, uh, yeah, uh, light shading. Next week we'll dive into compositing uh, and some additional effects elements. But uh, and this is going to be the last video. But uh, not before you enjoy today's lighting and shading. Well, uh, yeah, let's get into it. Hope you enjoy. Hey guys, welcome to part three. Um, sorry, this took a little bit longer than I uh, originally anticipated. It was a lot of work to clean up these files to be able to release them um, to you because they used assets from all over my system. It uses a lot of uh, external uh, models that I that I purchased. Uh, for example, Megascans assets, it heavily uses Megascans assets. And of course I cannot just include those in an OBJ file. So I needed to sort everything out, but here we are. Um, so we first want to talk over some stuff that I just need to get out of the way. So first off, um, these sequences will be very heavy to render. The, the scenes will be very heavy. If you have less than 64 gigabytes of RAM, it's probably going to crash for you. Um, if you have a low end video card, it probably won't render at all. You could still follow along by isolating certain elements and just uh, going on uh, through that but if you have for example only one uh, like 980 ti or whatever like an older car i don't think it might render but it will be very slow uh, the final frames took 12 to 15 minutes on uh, two 1080 ti's and one 1080 uh, scene startup time is quite quite long um, takes up quite a bit of ram to render so i recommend having 64 gigs of ram uh, so another thing um, as I mentioned, I use a lot of mega scans and I use some other assets. And of course, I cannot give those for free because they are paid assets. Assets. Uh, so I made a uh, text document here, and I also put it in a uh, in a note in in, in Houdini. Um, so as far as I know, these are all the assets that I'm using. So if you uh, you can you can get a mega scan subscription, and you can download the bridge, and like this is the the mega scans bridge, and you can get all of those uh, there. So you could just copy and paste all of these URLs. You can see which ones I used, um, and also some other thing um, I made the whole scene before the mega scans live link came out. So right now you have this uh, this live link. So let me fire it up which is quite quite cool. You can have the bridge and you can export stuff directly to Houdini um, by going to your library and then exporting. Uh, and it sets up a lot of things for you and you don't have to do any of that work. And uh, when I made this sequence, I actually did a lot of that stuff myself. So I made uh, some texture loaders and um, so I, I, I did a lot of work. So I did a lot of instancing myself. Um, so I'm using, I'm not using the the the, the live link in this um, in this tutorial. So keep that in mind. If you were to build this from scratch now, then I would recommend probably just importing most of the assets with the live link because it's just it sets everything uh, up as a good starting base to start shading. Uh, because you will see later, like all of my shaders are a little bit messy, <laughs> sort of say. Um, so. Without uh, just without further ado, let's let's dive into the into the tutorial. I just wanted to get that out of the way that the whole sequence will be very heavy and some of the shaders are a little bit a little bit messy. This whole project uh, with the car was for me to also to learn how to handle these very heavy heavy assets and um, uh, in 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 a way that that would allow me to to work. Yeah, just just to work 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 with all these heavy assets and to practice uh, all the shading and getting super realistic. So a lot of the stuff here it might not be the ideal way to do it. Uh, I think you will still pick up a lot of uh, interesting tricks maybe. Um, but in retrospect, there's a lot of things that I might have done differently. 
So to make all of that work, um, or to make everything auto load basically. So what what the the, the bridge does? It's uh, it downloads all of the stuff to your Megascans folder. Uh, you can you can export this obviously. But what I just did, is I have a, a Megascans um, thing here. So just put this to wherever your uh, Megascans downloads your uh, all of the assets. And then what I'm doing in there is I have a, uh, a script. Uh, so it's an H script and it just it creates an environment variable called Megascans. So let's uh, if I were to put dollar Megascans here, you can see this evaluates to wherever that is. So that's how I'm referencing all of the assets. So technically, like if this doesn't work, let me know and I'll need to update the file. But I, I think I, I should have linked everything up. Uh, but put this to your Megascans location and just put uh, the, the load variable to dollar job and make sure to set your dollar job to, um, to, your, uh, to your root folder where you put all of this. And then I think everything should load properly. Uh, so yeah, without of the way, let's uh, dive into it. All right, so I actually have um, two different sequences. So I have a, the scene assembling and the shading scene. So let's first open the shading scene. And why I did that is uh, the car asset is quite heavy and I'm for, I wanted to have a separate uh, scene to focus specifically on, on shading the car, uh, which was basically the first, first thing that I did. Um, so I have a subnet here where which I loaded all of the separate elements here. And this is a static export of the car, so it's not animated. Uh, so I could just work on it. And this is not a proper uh, shading scene. Normally you would you would uh, do a proper shading scene with a Macbeth chart and 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 uh, uh, and, 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 and the balls in the side. Um, if you if you want to learn more about more about this, uh, Saul Espinosa I think has has a pretty good scene on this on this uh, Patreon that talks about that. Um, but what I basically have here is just uh, let me show you. Just it's it's just the car. Um, so I'm just gonna go over. So this is gonna take a while to load. It's quite heavy, which is why I. Uh, did this in a separate uh, in a separate scene. Let's just put it to auto update. Right, so I have this car here and I'm doing, um, so I have uh, all of these individual elements here and as you can see, nothing is animated and uh, there's not really a lot going on here except for some materials. So basically what I did is I have, um, so let's get for example into the exterior group. And so then you can see here's just the Alembic with the, uh, with the exterior. I'm just scaling it down here because obviously this Houdini scene scale is, is uh, 100 uh, uh, times off. So you just need to scale it down. And then I just made a subnet. And in this subnet, I can do uh, selections. So I am um, I'm just making groups for the specific material types. And the way I'm doing this, so I'm doing this in a subnet. And then later in my scene assembly scene where I'm putting everything together, I can just copy the subnet and then paste it underneath the Alembic um, of the of the animated car. And that way, uh, like because I'm using Alembic paths for selection, and we'll talk about more about this later, it will just uh, uh, connect everything properly, even if some elements would be missing, for example, in the in the other uh, in the animated car, or if I, if I had changed some stuff in the model there. Um, so what the lambic paths are, you can see it goes add path uh, slash exterior. So if you go into the viewport, for example, you can go to select and go to alembic paths, and you can see this um, this drop down, and this is what you would get in Cinema 4D or in Maya, just like your your uh, your object tree, and you can see if I hover uh, over, over over it, um, it selects certain parts. So even if I were to go inside the Cinema 4D and delete uh, one of these parts. The selections in here, if I change the alembic, wouldn't uh, wouldn't change because they're based on the path. So as long as the group name doesn't change, all of the selections propagate. So that's a good thing to do anyway when you're working with alembics like this. Always blast based on uh, based on uh, based on alembic paths. So I'm just selecting stuff uh, like which needs to be red car paint, which needs to be glass, etc., etc., and I'm going through it. 
And then I'm assigning uh, just a base material first, which I'm assigning to the entire group. Um, just why I'm doing that is uh, like, if I'm just doing it, like if, for example, if I haven't grouped everything in a separate group, there might something be something that doesn't have any materials. So I just assign a base material first, which will just uh, be the base for everything. And then on top of that, I will stack the other materials. And I am doing it with material sops. Um, you could also alternatively do it if you open the, um, where is it? I don't, haven't used that quite, that that much, but if you open the data tree, you also have material style sheets. There's a master class on how that works. Um, it might might be a better way to uh, to handle all of this. I did it with the uh, with this way. Um, so that's how I handled that. Uh, and I did some sub level changes here to just like change some stuff. Uh, let me check what's what I'm doing here. So I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm insetting the. Uh, I think the 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 rim a little bit here because uh, as you can see in the download folder that you have, there's also some reference. So let me grab the reference. So if we go to the uh, reference folder, um, let's just open this with uh, photos. All right. So there was this inset thing which wasn't uh, it didn't really wasn't there in the model um, for some reason. So I just made an inset here, but just these are just some things that I, I just went through on the uh, uh, on the model. And these reference photos are quite nice to uh, to look at. So I use those to, uh, to first I shaded a sort of a base, um, sort of a base model. And then after that, I ended up dirtying, uh, dirtying up the whole, uh, the whole thing after I sort of replicated this look. So I, um, I just first made made the clean look and then I um, started dirtying it up. Anyway, so I'm doing uh, all of the other assignments after this. Uh, so just based on the groups and I'm assigning everything. And then you end up with the, uh, yeah, with the uh, outside shaded exterior. So I'm doing this for basically for everything. Um, and then later, as I said, in the scene assembly, I can just copy and paste this underneath the, uh, all of the trees for all of the things. So interior, I'm doing it, doing it everywhere, basically. Um, so yeah, then if we go into the car materials, uh, you can see how some of the shaders were built. Um, they are quite chaotic <laughs> the way I built them. So let, let's just, uh, let's just look at it. Let's, um, First, go to our out network. Let's just focus on one of the uh, one of the things. Uh, that's why I split this up anyway, so I can uh, like only focus on one of the um, one of the elements. Right, go to environment, and let's unhide all of the other things. And let's just load the exterior, and you know, then just see what's going on there. All right. So here we have the, uh, have the exterior and for the lighting here, we really, we only have like an HDRI, um, which is, uh, it's in, it's included in the download as well. It's, it's the same HDRI as I'm using in the scene assembly. Um, the very basic. Uh, so let's, let's just see how this looks. So let's go to the redshift render view. Uh, maybe let's do it other way around. Let's make a redshift render view here so we can tumble around on the top. Let's select the uh, the proper ROP and let's uh, run. Red wait for this to start up. And usually rush shift startup time is not really the fastest ever. And I think I need to put this to yeah, it's set to sRGB. I had no idea about S uh, OCIO when I did this, and I don't think the post effect was wasn't even included yet in the. Um, in the build back when I did this. So everything was just done in sRGB colors place. Um, so let's wait for this to uh, to fire up. And it's taking longer than it should. All right, there we go. Um, 
so yeah you can see uh, this is the this is the exterior a lot of stuff gets lost in the uh, in the final render uh, sadly which is why I also included a render of the of the Jeep in the in the breakdown I quite like the way this turned out I'm not the best lighter or shader guy ever um, as like mostly for the type of work I do I usually just do the uh, FX part and then do some lighting and shading uh, apart from that but so this was really for me a learning experience um, Let's dive into some of the shaders. I'm not gonna go over all of the shaders individually. Um, they, to be honest, as also with the um, with the materials, like I, I honestly don't know why I did some of the stuff that I did. Like, let's go into the red car paint shader. And it's way too big. Like, it's it's like it doesn't make sense why I made it. Like, why I did did a lot of stuff that I that I did. The thing is I was just playing around with the with the shader tree and I liked the way it looked so that's how I kept it uh, anyway I'm just blending multiple materials together uh, I'm not specifically sure which material is which but what I'm doing for the colors is just like I'm using a uh, Fresnel because everything has Fresnel as you know so I'm using Fresnel for the color uh, for a fall off so I can um, like, let me just put it to uh, iterative again so this would change to for now. You don't, you, know, you can see it uh, like a little bit when I when I change it around like that. Uh, but if you don't know what Fresnel does, it's basically the angle you look at it um, will change the way something looks. So let's go to the redshift render view. Uh, maybe let's do it other way around. Let's make a redshift render view here, so we can tumble around on the top. Let's select the uh, the proper rop and let's uh, run. Right, wait for this to start up. And usually Rushift startup time is not really the fastest ever. And I think I need to put this to, yeah, it's set to sRGB. I had no idea about S, uh, OCIO when I did this. And I don't think the post effect was, wasn't even included yet in the, um, in the builds back when I did this. So everything was just done in sRGB color space. Um, so let's wait for this to, uh, to fire up. And it's taking longer than it should. All right, there we go. Um, so yeah, you can see uh, this is the this is the exterior. A lot of stuff gets lost in the uh, in the final render, uh, sadly, which is why I also included a render of the of the Jeep in the in the breakdown. I quite like the way this turned out. I'm not the best lighter or shader guy ever. Um, as like mostly for the type of work I do, I usually just do the uh, FX part and then do some lighting and shading uh, apart from that. But so this was really for me a learning experience. Um, Let's dive into some of the shaders. I'm not gonna go over all of the shaders individually. Um, they, to be honest, as also with the um, with the materials, like I, I honestly don't know why I did some of the stuff that I did. Like, let's go into the red car paint shader. And it's way too big. Like, it's it's like it doesn't make sense why I made it. Like, why I did did a lot of stuff that I that I did. The thing is I was just playing around with the with the shader tree and I liked the way it looked so that's how I kept it uh, anyway I'm just blending multiple materials together uh, I'm not specifically sure which material is which but what I'm doing for the colors is just like I'm using a Fresnel because everything has Fresnel as you know so I'm using Fresnel for the color uh, for a fall off so I can um, like, let me just put it to uh, iterative again so this would change to for now. You don't, you, know, you can see it uh, like a little bit when I when I change it around like that. Uh, but if you don't know what Fresnel does, it's basically the angle you look at it um, will change the way something looks. Basically, it's a whole topic in its own. Uh, just Google Fresnel and see what it does. But I, I will uh, I will show you a little bit. So for example, if I were to make the um, so this is the the facing color and this is the uh, 
uh, the, the per color, I'm not sure what you would call it, the something, something color. Let's say if I were to make this blue, you can see I get the, like this purplish hue. And if I were to change this, uh, it's a little bit, you can basically, so it changes based on the angle that I'm that I'm looking at it. But you get this nice uh, this nice look, and you also get this a little bit with the uh, with the actual car. Um, so I just made that a darker red. I could also like for example, I could make this green, and then you get this. Uh, so then we're looking straight at this part. So that's blue, and then the other stuff is green. So that's just how I got it to look. Um, a little bit more interesting than just red. For example, if I were to look, look in just a red, I'm not sure if you're gonna see much of a difference, but you can see uh, you can see a little bit of a difference. Let's make it a little bit more interesting. Um, so some other stuff that I did. So that's the that's the main material. So if I were to just plug uh, plug this in, you can see now the uh, not all of the dirt gets removed. Let's go to uh, let's go over here. Um, so right now it's not dirty anymore and if I plug in the material blender you can see all of the dirt and the stuff uh, coming in so the dirt is let me check from which material that's coming so this is the basic car material uh, this is the basic car material so I think this is probably dirt so let's just plug, plug this in um, let's plug this into the this one by the way uh, so let's plug Okay, this needs to go in there. All right, um, so let's plug one of the other materials in there. So let's plug this in and uh, see what that does. So now you can see this is basically the dirt material which I'm uh, blending in. So now we have a uh, sort of very, very dirty looking car. And these these used uh, uh, use mega scans, basic basically. Um, so I'm, I'm using mega scans basically everywhere, anywhere. So when I'm blending those together, uh, that together, then you get a uh, nice looking dirty effect. So let's let's just look at one of the corners. And why is it not working? Why is it? Okay, let me just undo some steps. I did something somewhere, which is not what I suppose. Uh, anyway, so all right. So now we're back to the uh, to the crack look. Um, so that's that material, and we have a third material here. I'm not even sure what that looks like. Let me check. Oh, okay, so I think this is. Uh, yeah, that's the um, that's like the dirty specs that are that are on it. So these things, like the dirty raindroppy uh, type looks. Anyway, so I'm blending stuff together based on the curvature. So you have a curvature no node in Redshift, which is uh, this one. So if, I, for example, if I were to make this smaller, then you can see we start to dirtying it up quite a bit more. So. You can here use this as con concave or convex. Um, so if I were to set this to convex, then it would blend the other way around. So now the corners would be clean, and concave would be dirty. And you have you have there different types of uh, of yeah of, of concavity. And uh, I'm not sure what the exact differences are, but so you can just play around with this. And this is basically how I dirtied up all of the uh, all of the edges everywhere and. and uh, curvature is, is how you do that in general. So, um, yeah. Oh, and also I'm I'm reading in a wetness attribute here because I'm later in the in the process. I'm the the top here is gonna get wet. So right now it's not doing anything, uh, but later uh, it will. So it will get wet. Um, so we're gonna make a wet map. So I already made the attribute here that that we're gonna use. So. Yeah, that's basically uh, all of all I'm doing here. Um, same with the uh, um, with the glass on the front. 
uh, uses a lot of the same stuff. Uh, uses uses the raindrop materials that that you also were need 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 to download, um, and a lot of uh, that kind of stuff. So basically, I'm just doing this for every single part in the car. Uh, so let's yeah, let me, if we just isolate something else. Um, so if you were to do the driver, like the driver is probably the thing that's not really shaded that well. Like I have no idea how to do how to do people properly. Like I no idea. I just took the textures and I added some sort of surface scattering and stuff. And that looks like the driver doesn't look that uh, that amazing. But he's also in there. He has dri like the driver material. So just uh, just the skin. Just in a nice detail, like he looks a little bit like me. I guess every bald guy looks looks like me, I, but so does this guy. So I just added some uh, some subsurface scattering here, but it's not uh, it's not really doing that much. Like this is probably the thing: the driver, the animation of the driver, the shading of the driver in general wasn't really that great. It's what I got the most feedback on, but something to improve for next time. Um, but yeah, you can just go through how the whole car was shaded. This this is just like if you go to the car materials, um, like for example the glass. Like I uh, I'm using uh, like the water on the window. So if I go to the exterior again, um, just using the using like droplets uh, to create like a rainy effect. I'm doing that on all of the other materials as well uh, for like to dirty it up. But it's all basically just blending materials together. I'm not doing super complex complex stuff. I am uh, doing a lot of triplanar maps so the, the thing isn't UV unwrapped apart from the window. The window was UV, the windows were UV unwrapped because I needed the, uh, the terrain to project properly. If you look at the uh, terrain, so that's, that's, that's terrain texture. So you can see, like if you get close, it doesn't really look that amazing, but it looks, uh, looks kind of cool, I guess, like rain. Um, actually, it looks kind of cool. It looks better here than it does on the car, like this just looks like weird, dark stuff. Uh, anyway, you can uh, just go through this, uh, through all of the materials. Um, it's, it's, it uses the same basic sort of concepts. Uh, and with the assignments again, I used uh, I just assigned based on the alembic groups. The thing is, what I really did notice when I was working on this, um, this thing needs to remain packed. If you if you have an object like this and you unpack it, um, then it will it will crash. Redshift would crash. I it w I wouldn't get it to render properly. Um, even though I think it probably ne uh, Redshift needs to unpack it, I guess itself at render time. It's just so much more efficient when you keep packed alembics, uh, packed stuff in general. Like this, like the whole scene wouldn't work if I if I if I didn't uh, if I didn't keep it as packed alembics. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's go into the um, into the other scene, which is the the scene assembly. Um, where we're doing all of the uh, environment stuff and uh, scattering of the uh, of the assets. All right, so let's start into uh, diving into the uh, scene assembly thing. So again, you need to make sure that everything is linked up uh, correctly, um, because else everything won't work, obviously. Um, and with that, let's first dive into the terrain and just see how the. So let's turn off the foliage. Uh, so let's just see how the uh, terrain thing works. So let's dive into there, and we have the terrain here again with the color, which I explained in the uh, in the simulation thing, which you can ignore. Uh, cleaning that here, and then um, I'm painting uh, painting on top of it. So. Uh, basically, I'm using the paint shop, and everywhere where it's red, it will be muddy, and everywhere where it's green, there will be grass. So you can just paint on it, um, and then I'm using going in here, and then using the mud material. As you can see, mud reference in the mud material going there, and then what I'm doing is I'm looking up an attribute called color, so the color attribute, and then I'm using Redshift Color Splitter. And what that allows me to do is to split the color into R, G, B, and A uh, channels. And then I'm using the, the green channel 
to blend together two materials. So let's let's see what this looks like. So let's just go into uh, let's make a red render view again. Uh, let's click render. And to be honest, this looks quite bad. You will see in uh, in a little bit. So this is just the base thing, and then on top of that, we're gonna scatter uh, scatter stuff. So all right, this is not correct. It should render the yeah this one. Let's just put it to iterative. Uh, yeah, so there we go. Uh, so it's a little bit different from my original render. Um, Again, I said I needed to redo, redo some stuff when I did the tutorials. Uh, so the tiling is a little bit different from the mod, but in general, sort of uh, sort of the same. So you can see the grass looks pretty horrible. Uh, the mud looks kind of cool. Uh, but the main takeaway is that you can blend based on attributes. So I'm just using Material Blender and I'm blending two materials together. So here's the grass using Megascans. Um, so just using Megascans assets. So yeah, there's uh, there's the grass material uh, there using uh, using Megascans, uh, some custom something uh, blend together I think so that one is included, and then the mod also using some uh, Megascans. Uh, but yeah, in general, it does doesn't look that great, but it's uh, it'll be covered with like scattered assets, and then eventually it'll end up looking kind of cool. Um, so not a lot of crazy stuff going on. Uh, but yeah, so those are the inputs uh, for the ground. Now let's dive into the, uh, uh, the the scattered assets on top of it. All right, so what we're doing, I'm loading some models. Uh, so there's there are speed tree models and there's mega scans models. Um, speed tree were the free models uh, from the speed tree game dev things, and actually you cannot export the game speed tree thing by default to. Uh, to, to FBX or OBJ or Alembic or whatever. That's only in the cinema one. Uh, what I discovered is you can use, uh, so you can use Speedtree and then you can load Speedtree assets into Unreal Engine, which is what, what, it, what it's meant for. But then what you can do in, inside of Unreal, you can export the assets to FBX. So you can export the game assets from Speedtree uh, to FBX, uh, which is what I did. I don't have uh, Unreal Engine installed at the moment. Uh, I think I might have it installed, but I don't have any speed tree uh, subscription right now. Um, so, but I use the game models because like speed tree cinema is super expensive, and just for like this hobby project, it makes sense for me to to get to spend uh, like thousands uh, of, of euros on the uh, on the speed on that speed speed tree stuff, or or buy super expensive uh, models. Uh, anyway, so. Basically, what they are, what what I did. So they, these are the game models, and even though they're like they're quite low res, but they work quite okay. Uh, they're using a lot of sprites. Um, I'm just loading them in, transforming it down, um, and then I have like a, a bent shop here, which is just slightly animating like a bent thing here, which is using motion effects. So if you didn't know, you can right click on a channel motion effects and edit a motion effect. Uh, thing so like a noise and then it will randomize the pattern based on motion effects and you can change that I'm going to edit parameters noise and you can get this pop up and then you can uh, like change change the stuff or you can go into the motion effects view here and like do it manually um, so it, I did that and then I just have a VOP here which animates some uh, some more noise through it just to make it uh, move a little bit random so just the noise with uh, time plugged into the offset uh, and then uh, divide constant and then stuff is moving so I did that for all of the all of the assets and then trailing it obviously for for velocity so we get some motion blur, blur. Uh, and then the materials themselves are quite simple so not a lot of uh, not a lot of crazy things uh, going on there um, so uh, one thing I do want to mention is what I did is right now you have the, the bridge. Again, I said you should probably use that. But what, what I did 
um, which is still something that's super useful. Uh, if you ever used it, you can use galleries. So what you can do is uh, you can open your gallery. Where is it? There, gallery manager. And I already recorded this part before because and I forgot to put on my mic. So let's delete that one anyway. So this is also where your materials are, as you can see. Uh, but what you can do is you can save custom galleries. So let's say I want to uh, create something called uh, like my Megascans asset or my speed tree assets. I could, I have, so I have this, this asset which has all the material assignments, etc., etc. So what you can do is you can right click on it and then save to gallery. And then for example, so it's bush one and then uh, categories, I want it to be speed tree, um, and keywords, speed tree, and uh, yeah, so and then click accept, and then we go into your gallery again. Let's go to gallery, gallery manager, and you have a, another drop down here with a bush, and so it saved the entire definition. So if I drop this in again. And I get my bush here, so it's the same bush. It's different from HDAs. Uh, they are not like if I were to change something in here, it wouldn't update in here. So it's it just saves the definition as it currently is. It doesn't uh, get synced across um, across save states or something. But it's just super useful to like you can build a library of materials or or models that way. Um, so that's that's quite cool. Uh, so yeah, that's how I loaded in the, the, the speed tree stuff. And then there's the, some of the mega scan stuff. So basically the same idea. So if we go in there, so there's a fern here. So I'm just loading it in, uh, subdivided it a little bit. Uh, I'm just doing exactly, exactly the same. So it's just it's animating a little bit. Um, and then I also, oh yeah, um, and what I'm doing with, with these as well, I have a wetness attribute here. Because uh, I made, as I said before, I made a, um, a standard Redshift material loader. Right now they they, they have the Megascans uh, stuff already there, but I made the Megascans loader. And so if I dive into here, let's, make, let's just make it editable. Um, so I just, I put in an attribute here which allows me to, because I made a gallery just to test out workflows. Again, this whole project was meant to test out workflows and learn more stuff. So we're just loading in the in the general loader. I would load a wetness attribute. Um, so if any of the models would pick up on the wetness attribute, it would it would boost the uh, the speckler. So that's that's what is doing uh, what is doing there. Um, so the reflection weight gets boosted. Uh, so yeah, I'm doing that with all of these. Uh, all of these uh, things, and also some use uh, some need like opacity maps. So what I have is uh, most. Let me check if these also have. So the um, the material checks by default if there's a attribute called sprite, and if it's set to uh, to true, then it'll um, so if it's, it, it, it make, it mixes in, uh, the, the, the opacity and if it doesn't find the attribute then it doesn't mix it in. So it was just, uh, something so I could reuse the, uh, the asset everywhere. Um, so that was just for reusable purposes. So like, for example, cause the twigs don't need the opacity. So they will probably, so they have an attribute called sprite is one. So they won't use an opacity map else it'll error. I think probably if you press render as I think it's still errors in some places, but it's something that I did. Um, so yeah, I just did that with all of the uh, all of the models. So I'm loading everything in here. So that's basically just loading loading of the models. Uh, and then then there's this other subnet which uh, scatters the foliage. So that's in the foliage. So let's, let's dive into that. All right, so let's dive in there and then wait for everything to crash. No, I'm just kidding. So let's dive into the grass, for example. And so what I have here is I have instance nodes. Um, so instance nodes, they can be used to instance geometry. So for example, the grass. So what I, what I did here, so I, I load in the, um, I'm loading my terrain again. And subdividing thing and 
cleaning it and then I'm just painting. So everywhere where it's uh, black there won't be anything scattered and where it's white there will be stuff scattered and where it's gray it won't scatter a little bit. So I'm just scattering in the color space and then I'm offsetting them down a little bit so uh, I think they, f they were floating a little bit perhaps uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that's why I did that thing. Just randomizing p scale a little bit with a with a with a script. Uh, uh, there's a rent color here. I don't think I ended up using that because the thing is, when you when Redshift iterates through instances, if you randomize anything, it's going to be a lot slower. If you have a lot of instances, if it just instances the same thing, it'll be fast. If it instances through it and changes the color slightly, it'll it'll slow down significantly. Um, and then the main thing, uh, so a lot of people will use points and then use copy to points and then use stamping to like stamp on different uh, geometry, which is super slow. So what you can also do is the instance node, which I have here, it picks up on instances by the on an instance called attribute called instance by default. So what you can either do is you can plug in an object here and then it'll instance that if once it's set to uh, to point instancing. Oh, and by the way, with the randomized color thing uh, there, if you want to use an attribute in the shader uh, with instance stuff, you need to put it to full point instancing. If you put it to fast point instancing, it won't pick up on the color stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, so you can either drag an object in here to instance stuff on it. So I'm not sure if it gets overwritten, but if I were to put a box, I think it might. No, it doesn't override it. Um, but like if if I if it didn't find an instance attribute, it would start scattering boxes there. Um, but right now it does have an instance attribute. So what did what what I what I'm doing is so I'm creating a string called instance, and then the instance is looking for for the path. So it's going to the to the subnet where I'm loading the models. So that's that's going to be here, and then it's going to look in the uh, grass. So that, this is where it's pointing. So load models, grass, and then it's looking. Oh, do I like? Uh, so it's 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 gonna give an attribute called uh, uh, called grass one, two, or three. Because um, it's like I'm setting the max number of instances here. So there's an integer, and then with uh, integer in Toa, you can you can uh, change a integer to a string. Um, so I'm just randomly adding a value between one and three. Uh, I could make it four if I wanted to. So let's just look at the attribute. So you can see it's gonna look at there. There's gonna be grass one, two, and three. And if I would make it five, then it would look for grass one, two, three, four, five. Um, so and so the grass and then it's uh, adding this to the string with the uh, itoa command. So then you get a string. Um, so it's gonna look there and then it's gonna add. So it's gonna it's gonna instance the the, the object that it finds. And then another thing that I did is I I put up the um, uh, so if if the rent so if the rent ID is above uh, zero point nine seven so I'm just creating a random base on the point number then it's going to instance a different model and it's going to instance the tall grass so if you're going to look at like the so the regular grass is uh, is this and the tall grass is um, what's well, tall grass so ninety seven percent of the time it'll instance regular grass else it'll into tall grass and I want the tall grass to be a little bit smaller so I'm multiplying it by 0 0.6 and this is what I'm doing for all for all of the scattered stuff so I'm just this is the way I'm scattering anything and I'm, I'm on some places I'm randomizing some stuff so I think I think with the twigs there's uh, it's the same setup uh, randomized p scale but like some stuff if friend ID I want them to be bigger just just some, some stuff going on. Uh, this one can go. Um, didn't end up using that. Uh, but I think there's like an attribute randomize here to randomize the normals a little bit because they will be oriented in the normal direction. But for the most part, that's how I'm scattering things. Uh, I'm also placing some stuff manually. Um, so let's dive into the rocks and I'm saving again. So it'll, because the saving is super slow. 
I really noticed when in reading when you freeze certain like objects when you land when the hit pip file gets bigger so right now i think this hip file is like 80 megabytes then like some stuff like sl saving and just working in a hip file gets a lot slower i was talking to some guys from side effects and they were apparently aware of that issue and they, i think they were gonna try to um to solve that so, as you can see okay right um so on on this one i am placing them manually so what i did here is i just um referencing them all so i could also just copy and paste rock models but then it will end up using more memory uh, while if it's referencing one then it will only uh use the the the, the rock in memory once which and you can still uh you can you just move these instances manually if you want but it's still referencing the same rock so it doesn't duplicate the geometry like inside of this thing just only a point um, and then we have when you add everything together then you get a uh, yeah then you get this basically um, so right let's open up the foliage And let's just try to see what it looks like with the foliage and the, and the ground combined. Right, so let's go to the out, go to the test drop and ground render and let's also select the foliage. And this is probably gonna be like quite slow, but fuck it, let's do it. All right, and there we go. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, like even though the grass texture is horrible, with the scattered grass on top, it looks it looks quite okay. Um, does make it quite slow. I should have probably for the for these things, I should have probably used actual Redshift Sprite, so it doesn't uh, so I don't need the more like the higher trace depth. Um, but yeah, so uh, this is with the scattered geometry, and you can see it already coming uh, coming together quite nicely. Uh, so there's obviously still some stuff missing. So which that's the, the the mud and the water, and the mud mesh is not doing. Uh, it's it's using basically the same type of mud material, but like some stuff uh, is changed. So just loading it in here. Then I am so I'm pushing down some parts. Because, uh, like, if I don't do that, you can see there's like this pretty obvious bulge there, and I just wanted to to have it like pull in a little bit more because I I like the way that looked more because I needed to be like wanted to be a sort of a co more coherent thing even though there's like one piece there I think that in the raw raw render that looks a little bit weird I think I ended up fixing that in compositing. Um, but so I'm just saying, uh, and I'm doing, doing it here again with uh, the move down. So I'm moving stuff down there a little bit. Uh, and then what I'm doing here is I'm transferring the UV. Uh, Cause, okay, let's put a UV quick shade. I wanted it. So you might think it's probably weird to transfer the UV because I do have UVs on here, but you can see it's not really that. Cause the, the thing was moving. so. It wouldn't, the mud wouldn't look as pristine, or it, not as pristine, but it like it, it would lose. The, it would just start looking a little bit weird throughout the sim. So I'm just transferring it back from the original ground, and when, what it also does is um, then it allows for more of a continuous UV. And because it's not moving a lot, this 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 work completely fine. Um, in the in 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 the render like if it would move all over the places obviously wouldn't work but that's what i did here uh, and then this just has a uh, same type of mud material assigned and then the water also has uh, just a pretty simple water material assigned uh with a um image of refraction that's not not correct for water uh but um I think, yeah, so, but like I did that because like, I will show you what the problem was. 
right? So this was an this was an older render, and I still, for the life of me, don't know why this is happening. I tried everything. Uh, there's this weird flicker, flicker, flicker stuff. I tried remeshing a bunch of times. Nothing was solving it. So I think in the end, I ended up swapping. So uh, and started them with a static water mesh, and in the end, I think uh, just lowering the index of refraction more was changing it. I kind of like how the water there looks. I think you kind of lose that over here, but um, so the the water. But I I still I I think maybe it might have been a bug uh, in in Ratchet, but you you get this weird fling. It literally took me days to get rid of that. Um, but changing the index of refraction to something that's not correct apparently fixed it. Uh, so yeah, but like apart from that, there's not nothing really crazy I'm doing with the uh, with the water. Um, so that's the uh, so if you add that all together, then you get most of the of the stuff. Before we do another render, let let's let's talk about some other stuff that we need to do because there's also still the white water. So in the simulation scene, we also we did the white water. So let's let's open that. Uh, let's wait for it to load. So. Here's the white water. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just uh, creating a float called dense, uh, saying fit this value, uh, from fit the age between zero and the life, so the life of the particle, then fit it between zero and one, and then uh, make, an, make a ramp, um, so I can ramp the, the fade out over time. And then I'm deleting the spray, because the spray didn't look good. Um, and right now it's it's a still frame, uh, and then that's rendered as just as particles. Um, so I can show you what it looks like. So let's render the white water. It takes a while to load because there's a lot of points, eight million points. Just using Redshift particle rendering. And there we go. So it's uh, just pretty similar. Like if you have a high particle count and with the motion blur, it looks quite good. You can also use volumes to render this. Um, I just found this 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 looks quite good. Um, and I'm rendering this both in the beauty and I'm rendering a separate render. Uh, and then I also have the spray render, uh, which I only ended up using in compositing, which was a separate spray. And I have uh, like a ton of different versions. Of so. I'm not sure which one I ended up using. Um, we'll find out in the compositing uh, part of this tutorial, but like there's, like I did some extra things which would like when the car would go through the water to have this more um, effect. And I'm not sure which which one I, I ended up using. Um, but it's a whole bunch of different, uh, different ones. And just uh, the regular white water so I also rendered it the white water separately. So it is, it's in the beauty already, uh, as you could already see here. So it's it's in there, so it would also refract, like, ref, refract nicely in the water. But then I also ended up rendering this separately. So I could also still comp it on top if I wanted to uh, to boost boost the white water a little bit or grade it down or whatever. So this separate render that rendered quite fast. and. This uses the old white water system, by the way, so not the new one from uh, Winnie 17, because this was uh, before 17 came out. But I still, I, I like the way this this looks, and it from like it it forms these nice nice patterns that stick in the mud, and just I just like the way this looks. Um, so yeah, that's that's the white water, and then there's only one thing here remaining. Oh yeah, so the wet map, which I talked about a little bit early in the car uh, shading part. So, uh, it's run a wet map and it's referencing to the exterior. And actually what I'm doing is I'm blasting away this and I'm using point selections. I know I shouldn't do that, but I did here. Um, subdividing that. And I'm basically, I'm saying, Okay, this is gonna be not wet, and then I'm loading the water here, 
which if this were an animation this would work but right now it's not doing much but um so i'm just transferring these all right so and then when you go in here i'm just saying okay so add that to the previous one and then what you end up with is uh is let me just go into the wet map and you end up with a render like this So it's just a black and white thing. And it's also written out as an attribute, so you can also use it in the shader, so to make it a little bit more uh, specular. Um, which you can see has a little bit of influence here. I'm not sure if you can see it here. Yeah, this is a little bit, but I'm using it mostly in compositing to, to grade down the thing. Anyway, so I'm just saving that out and then I'm rendering it with the um, uh, what the wet map so as has a wet map material and then so that's that's this one and actually I didn't end up using the custom AOV but so how you would do a custom AOV because what I just did I used just an incandescent material so it would just be illuminating um, and it was fine but normally if you would were to do this um, so I just assigned the incandescent thing and turned off all of the other stuff like GI. But normally with custom AOVs, you would put in the material, so the beauty in, load your point attribute, say what the custom AOV would be called, then on the AOV tab, click plus, go to custom and call it the same. And then you would get a custom AOV. I didn't do that, I just used it, used it as uh, incandescent. Uh, but same result. Um, so yeah, then one more thing remains, I think. So let's turn off all of this stuff. And there's the the lighting, which is was quite simple uh, to be honest for this uh, for this thing. I didn't do do a lot with lighting. So it's just uh, it's an HDRI, um, which is provided. And let's turn this on. And another thing that I had, so I have lights following the car. So if I put this to, and let's also put the proxy mesh to, so you can actually see what it's doing. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're a little bit inside it right now, but like what, what I did is you can um, use, use an Alembic uh, transform uh, node and you can point to an to an alembic and then to the path and then it will extract the transformation and then you can just load um uh like like hooks hook stuff up, up to it and then it'll move with it so if i were to like put a box now and then hook it up to here and then it would move move with it like i'm not sure where it ended up now but because i didn't position it properly but uh, so the lights will move with the um with the car and i just ended up rendering that as a uh, just separate from my beauty just as volumetrics um so let's go in the uh go in the prop folder so renders um boop, 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 boop. for your metrics so yeah as you can see this is render rendered it as volumetric light so I just have a separate volumetric rendering so just render that in um and added it added that in compositing so for your metric used volumetric scattering and turned everything else off i think gi is or well, the gi is still on but uh, just using volumetric scattering and it's just used to comp on top and then the lights themselves obviously also just illuminate the regular beauty render so you do get uh, the influence with the uh, with the water and the ground um, like I didn't see a point like I didn't want this to look super cinematic based on lighting I just wanted to look, to look like it was shot with a uh, uh, with a mobile phone so just an AC URI and some basic lights made more sense uh, for the entire thing. Um, so I think that covers all of the elements that are in here. Let me double check. 
so yeah we have the cam like all of the all of the stuff i think i covered um so yeah just let's let's cover some 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 render settings that i did in the on the robs which are uh, not that interesting but let's cover it anyway um all right so basically go over the settings like i didn't do anything too crazy like there's unified sampling is quite low uh, I didn't mind having some noise. I was gonna denoise everything in comp anyway. I didn't use any of the sampling overrides. Uh, I wanted to like, I w the the renders were so slow anyway that I just settled for more noisy renders in general. And first the idea was like it needed to look like handheld um, uh, smartphone footage anyway. So I didn't mind some uh, some 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 stuff not being perfect. Global illumination, only two bounces, only 16 rays. I'm G I'm denoising the GI in compositing. Uh, yeah, like not really a lot. That just motion blur is on. I wanted to have a uh, rendered motion blur because that, that looked nice. And in compositing, we're doing it with motion factors just quite slow. Uh, and the compositing was gonna get quite, quite heavy anyway. So uh, I decided to not do that, but not really a lot uh, going on there, um, but yeah, I think so. Just those were the render settings, and and yeah, I, oh yeah, what I'm doing is I have uh, just referencing some some folders um, to where it needs to render out, and then just versioning and whatever. Um, oh yeah, and I'm using no multi-layered EXRs. Uh, depends, I guess, where you're comping in. I wanted to have it separate because uh, they would like because then I could just drag in in uh, uh, separate passes and that that would be a little bit faster. Uh, I guess it would depend on on what you're compositing in. I think in Nuke it will be better to to use uh, mul full multi layered EXRs. Um, so what I end up with my car is so this is what I ended up with. So just a top top ton of different renders. So beauty render. Um, check, I, I, re I rendered all of the different, like ever, like this is the GI, for example, super noisy. Um, I did GI raw. I have filled like diffuse filters, diffuse raw. Um, but like, so I just, I'd rendered everything separately. So the diffuse always looks, uh, quite weird. Um, so I just split everything up that way. Uh, so 24 different AOVs, Ren using crypto mats. Crypto mats are amazing, uh, even though the fusion implementation isn't that great, but we'll talk about that in the next part. Uh, but yeah, I think that uh, I covered basically everything. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Just leave me a comment, send me a message. Uh, if you run into any problems with the hip file, also let me know. Like, I think I, I fixed everything and everything should work. But because there were so many files that I had to go through, like it took me, took me days to, to get the file working. There was, there was more work than, than recording the tutorials. Like it took me so much time to, to fix, fix all of that. Uh, but if you run into any issues, let me know and I will fix the file. Um, but yeah, uh, I think there was there was everything. So uh, next part will cover the compositing and some additional elements. So because there's some additional stuff that I made, for example, the uh, like I have, uh, for example, I did rain, which is also used in the shader here somewhere, by the way. Um, so like I did, like there's the rain. I will cover that in compositing, even though it's an effects element. Um, I have rain drips. So those are, so that, that's, that's this thing. This is also used in the shader, by the way, in the uh, terrain here, in the environment. Um, so it's used here as a bump map. Uh, but I, for the most, for the most part, I used it in, um, I used it in compositing. So let's, uh, to just change some stuff. Uh, so there's, it's basically just this map. Uh, so yeah, but like that's everything. Let me know if you have any questions. Hope you enjoyed this part uh, and uh, until next time, bye.